Well, it's another video lecture from Tom Kennedy Science, and I'm, of course, Dr. Tom Kennedy. Now today, what I'm going to talk about is how do plants bend toward blue light? I know, isn't that weird? You know, we always think of plants as being stationary and not moving around like animals, but it turns out that plants can totally respond to their environment. They can respond to touch. And of course, I always talk about the Venus flytrap, but there's also a sensitive vine too. If you touch it, run your fingers down the leaves, they'll close up. Plants can also respond to light, and they can also respond to herbivory, and they can grow toward nutrients as well. So plants can respond to many different types of stimuli in their environment. They can also respond to gravity too, which is pretty interesting. But a plant responding to light, that makes a lot of sense because plants need light, right? They do photosynthesis. So growing toward the light or bending toward the light, you know, that makes sense. So they can do this. Ways that plants can respond to any type of environmental stimuli is through hormones. And hormones are chemical signals that cause some type of change at the cellular level. Now, because plants are multicellular organisms, they have tissues made up of cells that are all doing the same function. So a tissue might respond the same way to the same type of hormone. Now, in order for a plant tissue or organ to respond to a stimuli via a hormone or some type of signaling molecule, you have to have a receptor they can receive that hormone, and then once a plant cell can receive that hormone, it can elicit a cellular response. And if you remember from cell and molecular biology, there's an entire cascade of events that occur at the cellular level when they receive a chemical signal. And what I'm showing here on this slide are different types of plant hormones, things like ethylene. Ethylene's cool. It makes bananas ripen. That's how you can move a banana from Chile all the way up to North America. You can pop it with ethylene gas and it will ripen very quickly. That's why it can survive a very long journey, but not a day in your backpack. And of course, the one we're going to talk about is oxen. And oxen is found in almost every single plant and has lots of different responses. And one of the ones it helps do is help plants move or bend toward blue light. So for a plant to respond to any type of environmental stimulus, whether it's herbivory, gravity, or responding to light, you have to be able to detect that environmental stimulus. So if you're a plant and you're gonna bend toward the light, you know, you've seen plants bending toward the light during the day, specifically in this case, blue light, you have to be able to detect that light and then you have to be able to respond to that. So how do plants detect light? Well, guess what? Proteins are involved here. Proteins are involved with so many different cellular functions. They're also involved with detecting light. And that makes sense. We detect light. We can see, you know, all the different colors we see are created by different proteins. They can detect different wavelengths of light and different intensities of light. So it makes sense that plants can also use proteins to detect the light. And these are called phototropins. And there's several different types of phototropins that we've identified so far. And they're coded for by a couple of genes called FOT1 and FOT2. And uh, these phototropins, uh, they help the plant bend toward light to maximize photosynthesis. That makes sense, right? Now, chloroplasts, can absorb blue lights and red lights, but not so much in the green wavelength. And I discussed that in photosynthesis about the pigments. So if you're a plant, you want to move toward the bluish light. Now, why would you move toward blue light and not necessarily red light? Well, the answer is the blue light has more energy than red light. Remember, light moves in waves. And the shorter the wavelength, the more energy is in that light. So blue light, which is about 350 so nanometers, contains more energy than red light, which is around 700 nanometers. So um, plants will want to grow toward the light that has the most energy. And if you're wondering what a nanometer is, it's tiny. It's a billionth of a meter. But that makes sense, right? Because a protein is also 
is about a billionth of a meter in size. So you have a protein that's going to respond to something about the same size as it, give or take. You know, there's some differences here. So these phototropins, they detect blue light. And they're in these sensory cells at the tips of plants, okay? So you've got this sensory protein that can detect light, the tip of a plant or in the sensory part of a plant. But how does that cause a plant to grow toward the light? Well, whenever a phototropin detects light, it creates a cellular response inside that cell, that receptor cell. In this case, it creates a chemical messenger, a hormone. And this one is gonna be called auxin. And auxin has some pretty big effects on plant cells. So auxin is a hormone. It's also called endolacetic acid. And if you look over there to the right, you know, a lot of you might kind of glaze over the chemistry part. But on the right, you can see a carboxyl group. And that is part of the acetyl part of the endol. So endolacetic acid or IAA. And this hormone is found in all plants. And uh, it's found in different concentrations throughout plants are going to cause different responses in that plant. So auxin is, like I said, is transported throughout plants and has a major role in how they respond to their environment, including cell elongation. That's going to be part of our answer for how plants bend toward blue light. And the concentration of auxin in a particular region matters for its response. So these phototropins, they cause auxin to release. And in this case, as I said, auxin is not transported evenly throughout the plant. Now, this is another question that I actually don't know. But basically, the shaded parts of a plant get more auxin. Hmm. So we have this uneven distribution. Now, I'm not going to go into how the auxin is transported unevenly throughout the plant. Those cells that are receiving more auxin to change, or how they're going to respond to that, which causes the, cell, which causes the plant to bend toward the light. So let's take a really in-depth understanding here. Okay, we're gonna start with the acid growth hypothesis. So you've got a plant and I've got blue light up here that's gonna to bend toward the light. How does it do this? We're going to the light, man. We're not staying away. Okay, so inside these cells, oxygen's a hormone, they have receptors. The oxygen will bind to the receptors and it's gonna cause different types of cellular responses. And in this case, it's going to activate, wait for it, proton pumps. I know, here's another case of proton pumps being used. So in these cells, on the shaded side of the plant, away from the sunlight, uh, is going to bind to the receptors and cause these proton pumps to ramp up. And what they're going to do is they're going to start pumping more protons out of the cell and into the cell wall. Remember, you've got membrane and the cell wall is on the outside of the cell membrane. Now, because we're pumping the protons outside of the cell, we're increasing the concentration of hydrogen ions. What are we doing? We're lowering the pH. We're making the region right outside the cell and in the cell wall more acidic. Hmm, that's part of the acid growth hypothesis, right? So we're lowering this pH. Now, this has an effect on parts of the cell wall. Now, what it does is by lowering the pH, it activates these proteins called expansins. Now, remember, proteins, they do all kinds of different things inside of cells. And a lot of proteins, they exist in one or two conformations, sometimes many more. But in this case, you can be off or you can be on. And by lowering the pH, what we're doing is we're turning these expansions on. We're activating them. Now, here's what happens next. The expansions literally begin to unzip the hydrogen bonds that are holding the microfibrils together. Now, remember, you know, part of the structure of cellulose is that it forms hydrogen bonds, which help hold it together. So we're going to start taking those apart. So there's microfibrils in there that are held very tightly. We're starting to relax them, okay? We're relaxing them a little bit. That means they're not held in there so tightly. Now, all of a sudden you've got the cell wall around your plant, it's starting to relax. Hmm, what can happen next? Well, 
welcome back to transport again. As I pump protons out of the cell, I am creating an electrochemical gradient. That's our membrane potential, right? We're storing energy across our membrane. Now, in this electrochemical gradient, there are two parts to it. I've got an electrical gradient because protons are positively charged. So as I'm lowering the pH, right, by pumping more protons in there, I am making the outside of the cell more positively charged compared to the inside of the cell. And of course, there's more protons on the outside. That's the chemical part of the gradient. And then the difference in charge, that's the electrical part of the electrochemical gradient. Well, guess what? They're potassium ions. We're gonna see potassium a lot in cell biology. And these potassium ions, what they begin to do is flow into the cell because the inside of the cell is becoming negatively charged, right? Because you're pumping out those positive charges and potassium is also positively charged. So these channel proteins allow potassium ions to be pulled into the cell down their electrical gradient. Now, I'm putting potassium ions inside the cell. You add electrolytes into a cell. Potassium ions are an electrolyte. Remember, that's what plants crave, electrolytes. So as I add electrolytes into the cell, what happens? You lower water potential. When you lower water potential, where's the water go? Into the cell. And the cell, because I relaxed the cell membrane, the cell can then begin to swell. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Okay, so here we go. We're doing several different types of transport, actively transporting protons out, creating an electrochemical gradient. This allows the potassium ions to come into the cell. We change water potential. Water moves into the cell, right? All of these things work together. And then what happens is, you know, the potassium ions are coming in and then as the water moves into the cell, it's pushing up against the cell membrane, which pushes up against the cell wall that's been relaxed. So those cells on the shaded side of the plant are swelling up with water. They're getting larger. We're creating more turgor pressure. Well, what do you think is going to happen with the, as those cells begin to swell? The cell get larger on that other side of the plant. And as they get larger and larger and larger on this, on this side of the plant, it pushes the plant toward the light, oh, toward the light. And that is how the acid growth hypothesis allows plants to bend toward the light. It's pretty cool, isn't it? You never thought you would ever learn so much about proton pumps and transport and plant and animal form and function. Oh, don't worry, we haven't got to animals yet, but we'll see lots of transport there as well too. Well, this has been another episode of Tom Kennedy Science.